Good afternoon, Namaskar. I, Kriti Vadhira, would like to welcome all the teachers, learners, educators, students to CIET and CRT's live phone in program. And you are watching us live on PME with their channel number 11. This session will be for standard 11th students. English is the subject which we will be discussing in next one hour for you. And uh, we have got a very special expert. I would like to introduce Mrs. Gayatri Khanna. With, uh, she's there with us to be with you for next one hour. We welcome you, Mrs. Khanna, for today's live interaction program. Thank you so much, Kriti. So here, before, I mean, without wasting any time, I think we should get on with the two poems that we've got to do today. Absolutely, so Mrs. Khanna. <laughs> but before that, we have certain information for our viewers sure. to be delivered. Uh, if in, in between this one hour program, viewers, if you uh, wish to feel any, uh, ask any question to our expert, you may dial on our toll free number to tell us. Number would be double eight double zero double four zero double five nine. And if you want to watch the live streaming of this program, which is happening now on our official YouTube channel by the name of NCRT Official, there also you may send all your suggestions and questions to us uh, in the live chat box. Certainly, I will be taking up all of them from the li live chat box, and we'll be discussing with our expert today. One more medium to contact us. Kindly feel free to send all your mails to dth.class11 at the rate ciet.nic.in. So let's begin this English class. Uh, let's ask our expert again. Uh, I welcome you again, Mrs. Khanna. So in this uh, session, what are we going to discuss today? In this session, I will be talking of the Laburnum top in the first part of the segment. And in the second part, I will be talking about the poem, a photograph. So the way the poem has to be dealt with, we'll talk about this poem line to line. We'll talk of the mood, tone, setting, appreciation, the way it has to be dealt with in the class and the kind of questions that are going to be asked to them and the kind of answers they, they will be expected to give in for their exams, for their understanding, for assessment, for anything. So we'll discuss this poem line to line. Absolutely. And viewers, we will be having two separate poems, two different poems from your textbook uh, by the name of Hornbill. And our expert will be explaining line by line each of the poems. Uh, you may proceed, Mrs. Khanna. Thank you so much. So here we begin with the poem, The Laburnum Top. So the poem begins here. Uh, as you know that I've tried to create certain images for you. The only two things that we're going to talk about over here is the laburnum and the goldfinch which comes in. And that's what the poem is about. So the fir first, before we start the poem, let's talk about the poet. He's Ted Hughes. So all of you who've read Sylvia Plath, the mirror, what was included earlier in your syllabus, not anymore. He's Sylvia Plath's husband. He is a very well-known English poet. He's a translator. He's a writer for children. And he's regarded as one of the best poems of the generation for this 20th century. He was appointed the Poet Laureate in 1984. And until he passed away in 1998, he held this post. And he is therefore a very well respected, especially a children's writer. So here, as I said, that we're going to talk in terms of the poem. And there are just two things that we need to notice. The laburnum. What is the laburnum? The laburnum is a tree, a form of a tree. It's called Amaltas in India. It's got those yellowing flowers. The, here's a picture you can see. It's like a piece hanging. And it becomes, uh, it sort of uh, becomes yellow in late spring. And the second what we're going to talk about is the goldfinch. Finch is the most common Indian bird that you see. It's the brownish color bird. Now, this has various species. The goldfinch over here that we're going to talk about is something which is found in England. So you can see, please notice the word bird because we are also going to talk of the barred face of its identity that the poet talks about. So observe the bird. And then now we finish, now we begin what the poem is about. See, very typically to understand a poet or a poem, you have to see where is the setting? Where does the poem take place? What is the tone and the mood of the, of the character or the person or the object in the poem or the story or the drama, as well as the tone and mood of the poet or the story writer or the playwright. So first we'll begin like that setting where does it setting is where does it take place 
So it's a bright September afternoon. So you know it's autumn. And what happens in autumn? The, uh, this, the leaves start becoming yellow because they start falling. And winter, you know, as, as you know, winter's there. And once again, they come to life in spring. So it's a bright September afternoon. September over there is sunny and bright. So you see the whole color of the poem is going to be yellow. Please notice bright September afternoon, the laburnum. It's again a tree with yellow flowers. The tree with hanging branches and yellow flowers, it's standing soundless and motionless. As the poem begins, the tree is silent and still. A few leaves that have yellowed, have fallen, and there's some seeds and leaves that are scattered around it. Because autumn has set in, it's time for the leaves to, uh, the trees to shed their leaves. So that's the setting. It takes place here. Then look at the tone and mood. The tone and mood will change three times over here. It is still, it is quiet, it's pensive and thoughtful mood. And then suddenly, the bird will come in. The whole tree will liven up again. And it will twittering, chittering, chattering, all those words, anamotopic words which are used. The tree, it's as if it's coming alive. And then when the goldfinch leaves the tree once again, it subsides into, again, the still and the quietness that it began with. So we have the setting, we have tone and mood, which changes price. Now look at the first change. All of a sudden, the small singing bird, which is the goldfinch, it arrived with its yellow feathers. It's chirping and very smoothly it glides into the tree like a lizard. And as the goldfinch enters the tree, the tree seems to come alive. It starts up like a machine. There is sound, there is twittering, and it's as if it's moving, it's quivering with joy. And where has she come? the bird has come to her nest so the it's the nest it's it's like an engine of a family she's added life to the tree by coming in she's flitting from branch to branch and she's showing her striped face the yellow and black markings that i just showed you i said observe the finch so you know it's like a barred face it's a marking which is very peculiar to the bird and then finally with the low mysterious whistle she again she departs into the sky and the laburnum once again it quietens down the way it had quietened just before her arrival now look there are four structure four stanzas over here the first is three lines it tells you where the setting is the second is the longest one with Three, nine lines and which is describing the activity of the poem which is that you know it's quivering it's twittering it's chirping the bird and everything and then then there are three lines and the last stanza has only one line in it so there is no rhyme scheme when there is no rhyme scheme it's called free verse so some lines because there is a lot of activity over here so it is very uh, swift, the poem moves very swiftly. So some lines are very short and they are depicting movement. So now let us look at this. Let us look at the poem line to line. The first stanza, the laburnum top. I'm going to be talking of uh, appreciation. That is basically what you need to know the figures of speech. The laburnum top is silent quite still. Now see, when they talk of laburnum top, it can have two meanings. One is top is the exterior. It doesn't mean the peak of the tree. It means the exterior, what can be seen outwardly. It's silent, quite still. So basically, what is this figure of speech? It is personification. The tree is silent and still. It's the human quality which has been given to the tree. And look at the depiction of the time. It's afternoon. Afternoon means yellowing sun. September sunlight, which is again yellow, golden. A few leaves yellowing and all its leaves fallen. So what the question in the book is, what is the color of the poem? The color of the poem is yellow because you see the afternoon, yellowing sun, September again, it's a sunny month. The leaves are yellowing because they are drying. The seeds 
yellow leaves yellow seeds are falling down so basically now there two uh, look at the appreciation i said laburnum top its personification it's silent and still there is no movement it's being likened to it these are the human qualities which have been given and then cynic ducky is the other one top is the exterior basically part for the whole cynic ducky is a figure of speech with where you use a part to describe the whole so the top is not only the exterior is the top as i had said it's the entire exterior or the entire tree so what is the mood it's slumber it's silent it's the absence of breeze and there is no spontaneity of life the leaves are appearing yellow the leaf, the seeds have fallen so what is the mood it is silent it's like dead it's pessimistic mood and you just see how the mood is going to change in the next chapter so suddenly the bird comes the it comes with a twitching chirrup so this pessimism it's quickly changed into the vibrance of life the gold fit is like a soul of the tree coming and she's sort of uh, her exuberance is transferred on to the tree there is a twitching chirrup that not only alerts the tree but the creatures in the tree itself so here sorry sorry a suddenness look at the words that i use i'm not going to talk of simple poetic devices like alliteration because you've been doing it for long enough now so suddenness startlement at the branch end again it's not only at the end of the branch it's not only the exterior that there's a whole branch that becomes suddenly it startles up there is such sudden life into it then sleek as a lizard as a lizard it's a simile there is only one point of comparison over here that smoothly sleek she just glides in and alert and abrupt alert and abrupt again there is alliteration now see there are signs that there are signs which get reflected in suddenness and there is a startlement sleek depicts that the gold finch she is going into her nest which is hitherto till now it was undiscovered now here please notice when i talk of the four themes one theme over here is motherhood here what is the bird doing she is gliding into her nest to look at her little ones the thoughts of a nestling are there in her mind even if she is away and search of food so basically what does she do she just comes back to her nest she has been away it has been silent and suddenly she comes back she enters the thickness sorry she enters the thickness and the and the machine starts up here it is metaphor it is metaphor so basically when you talk of the machine it's an implied comparison it's not a direct comparison like sleek as a lizard so more than one point in common what are the point in common it is the movement and the sounds and you please notice the visual and the verbal uh, the visual and the verbal imagery basically which has been created she enters a thickness thickness the foliage and a machine starts up so they are not telling you that this is machine is of chittering chattering the nest everything which has come alive now so the comparison is more than one it is about sound it is about movement so of chitterings and a tremor of wings and trillings look at the onomatopoeia onomatopoeia here because these words in themselves mean nothing but they these words are conveying sound and movement of chittering chittering is sound tremor of wings again it is movement trillings sound the whole tree trembles and thrills so look at the word thrills the tree has suddenly come alive because of the bird that has entered the thickness of the tree so there is a metaphor as i said it is the engine of a family she stalks at full plucks out to the branch end showing her barred face identity mask now there are two meanings of barred face see when i say that it can be interpreted in various ways one cbse in its exam allows you to interpret 
anything logically. However, whether it's 20th century interpretations or whether it's case book series, both have given two, uh, two explanations. One is when you talk of a barred face, that is an identity which is very peculiar to this bird. So it is her and the second, some critics have also said that because through the foliage, her face is looking barred. Like it's got, the, it's as if she's in the bars of that, uh, the foliage over there. So basically both of them are correct. You see what suits you. It is the engine of a family, engine of a family, the nest, the nest and the nestlings. She stokes it full because she's feeding them. And then again, she's come out to the end of the branch and she shows her face. The nest is not visible. She's showing her face one more time. As I said, it's metaphor. It's impl implied comparison between the mother, that is the goldfinch, and the machine, which starts up. You please notice the imagery. It's visual imagery, as well as the sound imagery. The tree is a machine, and the engine is none, none other than the goldfinch. It's like the body and the soul, it comes alive. The arrival changes the mood of the tree. It was silent, it was quiet, it was pessimistic, and suddenly it's come alive. There is chittering, there is tremor of wings, there is trillings. It's as if it's rejuvenated one more time. The tree has come alive. And then, with an, with an eerie, delicate whistle, chirrup, whispering, Eerie is mysterious. Now, mysterious and delicate are two opposite words. Delicate, very welcoming. Eerie is something very unusual, mysterious. So the opposite words to convey an idea, this figure of speech is the oxymoron. It's oxymoron, right? She launches away into the infinite. Infinite is metonymy. What does metonymy mean? Metonymy is a symbol. We talked of cynic docky first. Cynic docky is a part for the whole. When you talk of infinite, that's the sky. It's a symbol for the sky. For example, if I say the bench decided, it means the jury. When I say the crown decided, the crown is the crown of the king. So therefore, that is a symbol. This cynic docky and metonymy should not be confused. So she launches, she gives that strange peculiar whistle, which is a very delicate whistle. It's not hurting your ears. She launches again towards the infinite, towards the sky. Now there is now sudden, there was a sudden arrival and there is a sudden departure of this bird. So this is, it's all momentary, exactly like the soul. She came into the body and it's leaving once again. So there is basically the mood is of mixed sense of joy and tension. Once again, she has gone. So here we see that and the laburnum, and the laburnum, it subsides to empty. Once again, see the, the mood has come a full circle. Quiet, silent, suddenly it comes alive with the arrival of the bird. There's twitching, there's chirruping, there is tremor of wings, and there is the bird, the engine sort of starts up. And then finally, when she leaves, the laburnum subsides to empty. Once again, the tree has become empty. The last line contains a metaphor. It depicts the, the absence of sound. It's a symbol of uh, lifelessness. Now, let me tell you one more thing, uh, which is laburnum. I mean, this is nothing that the students have to retain just for your information and understanding. Laburnum is a symbol of Aphrodite. Basically, it was that to uh, Ted Hughes, it meant earthly love. And the coming and going of the finch is Sylvia Plath coming into his life and going away. So basically, it was then when the poem was written, just for your understanding. Although as students, you don't have to retain it. So basically, to tell you, and now, now what are the themes of the poem? As I said, that when you are asked questions, basically from poetry, it is tone, mood, setting, appreciation. Appreciation is nothing but poetic devices. It's justifying the title. And then there are themes as well. Now here you see there are four themes. First is the change, autumnal change, the change which the weather gets in. It's pessimism. 
it's yellowing, falling, and then motherhood, arrival of the goldfinch. And then there's transience of natural beauty. It changes the natural beauty. It changes whether it's seasonal. And here, with the, with the coming of the goldfinch and the goldfinch flying away, it has changed very suddenly. Then there is resonance of life. Life has been reflected. It is a, like the sound and the movement. It's all a symbol of life. So basically, the title of the poem, the laburnum top, because it, the poem revolves around the laburnum top. It is quiet, the finch coming in, light, the, it com, it's coming to life again, and then the finch is flying away. So the, it subsides again into loneliness, again into emptiness, again it is almost lifeless. So basically, it is you have to, while you do this poem, you have to talk of the change in mood. You have to talk of the setting. You have to talk of the appreciation. We talked in terms of various poetic devices, whether it is simile, whether it's alliteration, whether it's metonymy, whether it's cynic talky, and of course, this imagery. There is a lot of sight and sound imagery, as you say. We call it visual and oral imagery. Please remember, oral is what you can hear. Visual is what you can see. So this is... The liber this is about the laburnum top, short little poem, about 13 lines or less. It's about, um, yeah, it's about that much. And now, um, do you have any questions? If the questions come in, otherwise we can move on to the second poem. I would surely ask my viewers again here that if you have any questions, viewers, you may please write in the chat box. Um, on uh, NCRT's official, where the official streaming of this program is being happening. And uh, I can see many viewers are watching us live, Mrs. Khanna. So you, we, we may proceed with the second poem. And if we are getting any questions, I will surely take up most and we'll have a discussion on them. Most certainly, most certainly. You're welcome to ask any questions from her. Okay, so the second poem. Now this poem, a photograph, it's by a poet called Shirley Toulson. So let's talk about the poet as we did about uh, the other poet also. So basically, this again, we have a poet who was born in the 1924 and passed away very recently, 2018. This, she's a, again an English poet, journalist, and a local politician. You know, basically her poem, she's written few poems and you talk in terms of for several uh, books on walking routes by the farmer and livestock. So basically she's, um, there was this informal group which was called informal group of poets, which was called the group. So basically she was published there. It's not that she's a poet of great repute as such, like if I compare her to Ted Hughes, but then is a very interesting poem. And this poem is extremely interesting for probably any reader. So here we coming straight about the poem. So basically what is a photograph? Now the photograph is, it's a photograph which depicts three children, basically. And, and it is about the transience of life. The life is, life changes, it becomes, it ages and it dies down. So, so about when we talk about the poem, what is seen in the photograph that the mother had a very sweet face and it was sweet even in the photograph and it was a sweet face even before she was born the poet. Her face had changed a bit. The mother's face had changed, but the sea had remained unchanged. Please look at the juxtaposition. It's, it's opposite ideas. The face changes. Transience of life, it's being pitted against the permanence of nature. That's a very important point in this poem. The face had changed little, but the sea remained unchanged. The sea washed their transient feet. Again, it is transience of light. It's cynic ducky. I'll talk about the figures of speech when I do the poem. The sea washed, the sea which is permanent, it washed their transient. Feet is not transient, the entire life is transient. So feet is a part for the whole. Again, a cynic ducky, which we had an example in the previous poem as well. The mother is now dead. The poet recalls how 20, 30 years later, 
that is later than the photograph was clicked the mother would look at the photograph that was 20 to 30 years mother was then around 12 years old so 20 30 years later she would look at the photograph and she could recall with amusement how these young girls had been dressed for the beach that is where the photograph had been clicked the mother was nostalgic about the holiday to the beach three girls mother and her two cousins had gone the mother missed that beach holiday and now when the mother is dead and gone the poet she relives the memories of her mother the mother missed her past when she was a child the poet misses her mother because the mother is now dead now she recalls with pain the memory of the mother's laughter she can still vividly recall the mother's laughter the mother's died quite some time ago that is as old as the girl was that's 12 years back without her so the poet has lived without her quite a quite a part of her life with the passage of time the poet she faces a mute silence the silent silences there there's no word to describe the grief that the mother feels at the death of the and the poet feels at the death of her mother so basically now let's come to the poem i'll talk about this line to line again and i'll talk in terms of uh, that uh, figures of speech as well the cardboard please notice the word cardboard it's used for the photograph why because there's no life it's just a memory now the cardboard shows me how it was that was this is just a memory on how it was when two girl cousins went paddling they went to the sea for paddling each one holding my mother's hand so these two girl cousins look at the photograph you'll have one one picture this says a thousand words so i put some pictures so that you can remember and this will stay in your mind the mother was little older and she went two cousins were folding her hand on either side and she the big girl some 12 years or so the mother was then the big girl and the big girl was how old at that point of time 12 years so this description of the photograph is it's of the moment that was captured in this photograph which has now become worthless it's like a piece of paper it's like a cardboard because the life's gone out the use of the word cardboard because it's now a piece of paper the mother is dead so what does it show you it shows you that life is transient what remains is a insignificant paper now Now the second stanza this is the mother's recollection of her childhood just as the poet recalls the mother who is now dead the mother recalls her childhood when she had gone peddling that is she when she's talking to the <clears throat> years later she talks to the poet her daughter about how it had been the right. day when they walked Uh, Mrs Khanna I would like to stop you here as there is a technical glitch and we have to take a a, a few sure. seconds break we will be coming sure. right back we was on PME Vidya's channel number 11 with the same session of english for you we'll be proceeding the same remain connected to PME Vidya channel number 11 sure welcome back viewers i welcome you again on PME Vidya's channel number 11 we were having a live interaction program on uh, english for standard 11 students and we were discussing two poems and uh, we were in middle of a poem uh, by the name of a photograph of your textbook uh, in hornbill uh, i welcome our guest again mrs khanna who were beautifully discussing about these two poems uh, you may proceed mrs khanna with what we were discussing Thank earlier you so much so we we finished with a stanza one which was the description of the cardboard which was a photograph when the three girls had gone paddling and we on the second paragraph now or the stanza now which says the mother's recollection of a childhood the mother's dead and gone and the poet is remembering her mother just as the mother remembered her childhood through the photograph so all three stood to smile through their hair through their hair because the hair was all over the face the photograph is there so you can have a look at the uncle with a camera who had clicked mm-hmm. the photograph the photograph had been clicked by the uncle who carried a camera a sweet face my mother's was that was before i was born when the mother was young she had a sweet face before the poet was born 
and the sea which appears to have changed less. That means the nature, the permanence of nature, the sea has changed less, whereas the mother had aged by the time the poet was born. Washed their terribly transient feet, the, the sea washed their transient, transient short-lived. So transience of life, the life which can die, people which are given, who are, all of us who are given to death, and the sea or the nature which is permanent. Two figures of speech, please remember, cynic ducky, transient feet. Feet are not transient only, the whole body is transient. Life is transient. So therefore, apart for the whole, transferred epithet. Epithet means an adjective. So the life is, it washed the feet. And so it is the adjective is placed on another place. So that is transferred, the adjective is transferred. So we have basically two figures of speech over here. And now we, we just go on to the stanza three. Now the stanza two, as you know, the camera had captured the poet's mother with the two girl cousins. The girl cousins, their names were Betty and Dolly. When they had gone paddling, they were holding the mother's hand on either side. And the elder, that's the mother, was about 12 years. Three of them, they stood smiling at the camera and the wind had tossed their hair. So now here we go to the stanza three. Some 20, 30 years later, that is when the mother was say 22, 32, that is 20, 30 years after the, after the photograph had been taken. She laughed at the snapshot. Who is she? The mother. See Betty and Dolly. Betty and Dolly, her two cousins who were there. And she'd say, she would say that because now she's dead and gone. And look how they dressed us for the beach. The girls were wearing a beach dress. She would tell her daughter to look at the photographs and she would happily recall the photograph and the time when she went to the beach. The sea holiday was her past. The sea holiday, that is when she was a child, it was her past. Mine, her laughter. The, for the poet, the laughter is a thing of the past because the mother is now dead and gone. Both arrive with labored ease of loss. Labored ease of loss because the loss of death, the loss due to death, the loss of the mother is not easy. So she's laboring. And ease, why? Because the second is Khanna, I would like to stop you here. Um, we are getting yeah. a query from one of our viewers. If you could, yeah. could just please go back to a uh, few slides, the earlier slide I would request you and uh, could you please explain what you were explaining? Uh, Your audio slide? was quite low so our viewer could not understand it. Just okay, explain last, it two, three lines. Last time. Okay. Yeah, please. Now, now she's dead. Now she's been dead nearly as many years as the girl lived. She is the mother. She has been dead for nearly as many years as the girl in the photograph had lived. So the first time I tell you, the girl has lived for about 12 years. So this mother has been dead for about 12 years now. And of this circumstance, this circumstance of death, there is nothing to say at all because death is it's something so grievous, something so painful, something so hurting that there are no words to express that grief. And of this circumstance of the death, there's nothing to say at all because it's silence, silences. The silence of death leaves you speechless for any words. There are no words to express the grief which the poet feels. The silence of death caused by the death of the mother cannot be explained in words. So personification silence has been personified it silences something silent like a teacher silences the students so silence silences paradox silence which itself is quiet it makes you quieter still so basically now we're just going to talk about very quick recap that the holiday was the past for the mother and the photograph which reflects the mother is a past for the poet because the mother is also dead and gone. And of this circumstances that the mother is dead, there are no words to explain because both the situation, the mother reliving her memory of the childhood and the poet reliving the memory of the mother, both are a memory of the past. The first is the mother's past. The second is the 
poet's past. So now the main idea, that, that death can numb you and leave you at a loss of words. The finality of death cannot be expressed. Death can silence you. It can re leave you speechless. So the silent silences. The other idea is mother missed her past and she was amused. However, the daughter missed her mother because the mother is dead and gone, but she's, it's a labored ease. She's trying to come to terms. Transient feet has a special significance. It shows the transience of human life, which is given to death and the permanence of nature. The poet realizes that she's lost her mother, so the labored ease of loss sets in. Labored ease because it's time, it's difficult for her to forget her mother and put her past behind her and move on. It is ease because the time has elapsed and it has reduced, the pain has reduced with the pass passage of time. You know, time covers some certain wounds. Time acts as a healer and the daughter moves on. So although she has not really forgotten, there is a great sorrow and pain, but this pain is not as acute as it was when her mother had left her and gone. So basically, what is this poem about? This poem is about a piece of paper, which is basically a photograph. Why is it called a cardboard? Because it's been reduced to just nothingness. It's just a memory of the past. And what was in the photograph? Mother and her two cousins, Betty and Dolly, in their preteens. They'd gone paddling with the uncle who had clicked the photograph at the sea beach. And there were sweet faces. They were gazing through the, through the hair which had been tousled on their face. And it's the feet, the sea, the permanent sea, the permanence of nature was watching, washing their feet, the life which is transient. 20, 30 years later, she looks at her photographs and she says, "How look how they dressed us for the beach. So it's a happy memory for her. And while her daughter, the poet, she recalls the mother's smiling face and she's, she's sad. She's not very happy because the mother is dead and gone. Both of them, the, that is the mother and the poet, they have moved on in life despite the losses. Now she's been dead for about 12 years. The void in the life of the poet is the silence and the gloom that she feels at the death of the mother. So basically, this is what the poem is about. So now, are there any more questions or shall I just sum it up uh, some yes, of the two you must just sum up your ppt first mrs khanna okay okay then let me come to it the first poem that we did was the laburnum chop as i said we have to i would request you to kindly make a full screen of your ppt so that it is properly visible to all okay. our viewers okay so i was just uh, finally i was just going through here yeah so see what we have to do when we do the poem when we do the poems we have to as i had i'm repeating again we have to do we have to talk of the setting where does it take place just as the laburnum top is a tree in autumn where the leaves and uh, leaves and seeds have fallen this is a room a house where the girl she's sitting looking at the photograph and she's nostalgic about it what is the mood of this poem the mood of this poem fluctuates between happiness and sadness. It's happy. The memories on the on the photograph are happy. The memory of the mother when she recalled her childhood is happy. But the memory when the poet recalls her mother is sad. So this poem, it fluctuates. So while there were happy memories, it's transience of life, which makes the poet thoughtful and sad. And then the tone and mood, it keeps changing. The tone and mood of the poem keeps changing. The first part, when the mother was clicked with the photograph and the memories were happy. In the second part, the memories are not that happy because she's talking in terms of the mother dying after, soon after that. The third is, as I've talked in terms of appreciation as figures of speech, like we have, uh, we have, uh, paradox here we have basically personification here so you have to to be able to answer all the questions just understand your poems well and understand the kind of idea which is put across by the poet 
visual and a photograph because the, you have to justify the title. The photograph is a title which says it is the it revolves the poem revolves around a photograph. Although the life has gone off, the photograph is still there from line one to line la the last line of the poem. The poem actually revolves about the photograph. Even the sea is a part of the photograph. It's juxtaposed life, life and death, permanence and temporary. It's being juxtaposed. So therefore, whenever you do any poem, kindly look at these four points. And with this, I guess we wind up uh, our session and I'll answer any question which is there to be answered at the moment. Yeah, Ms. Khanna, <laughs> the two poem which all our viewers witnessed today, I mean, the title itself were very simple to understand. That's and, right. Uh, These are very simple poems. Yeah, basically. I know. And the, the, the poetry was also very simple. Um, a photograph was very nostalgic poem. And uh, whereas uh, in the Liburnum, we seen um, some natural, you know, uh, things were discussed. Absolutely. What we see Absolutely. in day-to-day -day lives. So, would you encourage these 11 standard students, um, most of them who will be taking up English as their main uh, career, or we yeah. will be studying English as an honors subject further. So do you feel yeah. that this kind of poetry, with help of this kind of poetry, they can enhance their skills of Ab writing as absolutely. well? What would you say absolutely. about this? Absolutely. Absolutely. When these books were made, see, since I've been a part of the NCRT for their material production, please let me and let me tell you that the books are made with a certain thing, uh, certain say, parameters in mind. These poems that we do or the chapters that we do, first, they're multicultural. They are yeah. from different parts of the world. They're multi-thematic. They root the children to reality. And here, when we talk in terms of poetry of the modern, this is the modern period that we are talking, it's more like colloquial. It's the way we talk. It's yeah. simple. Yeah. Right. It has, Despite that, it has the beauty of poetry with all the poetic devices. There. Just to ask you a little question here as well. Uh, you started the session with the introduction of the poet. Of the writer. That's right. So, That's right. uh, how important it is to know the poet, and uh, I can see uh, the way you explained that NCRT has kept in mind while framing this curriculum and uh, adding on these poems. Sylvia Plath, one of the most famous, I would say, even I have read uh, Sylvia Plath when I was in 12th. So, how important is it is to know the poet? It is very important to know the poet because you always place a poem in the context of when it was written. For example, if it is a modern poet like Yeats, you will talk in terms of the postmodern era when he suffered two wars. Right. So when you're talking, but you know, thankfully these two poems, they are not as the writers, the period that they were writing is not as important because both the themes are universal. Right. The first, the first is nature, and the second poem that we did is the love of the. It's a parental, the mother's love, the maternal love of the mother and the daughter. So these two themes are universal, which are true of any era, any period of time, any part of the world. These are universality. This is that. That's why we call it universality of poetry. So here, in fact, the other poems also that they have in class 10, whether it's father to son or something, they have very universal themes. I think class 10, uh, sorry, 11 has very, very simple poetry. And all the poet, all the poems are very universal in nature. So right. here, the poems are not as important as they are in class 12. Right, absolutely. Yeah. It is really important for you to understand the poetry and to know about the poet itself and how beautifully our uh, today's expert, Ms. Khanna, explained these two poems for you. I really thank you, Mrs. Khanna, for joining us today for this live interaction program. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And viewers, uh, remain connected to PME with there because on P uh, channel number 12, we will be having a psychology uh, session for standard 12 students. Remain connected. We will be coming back just in a short while. Thank you.